Everybody and a very warm welcome and a very warm welcome to our international audience who are joining online now. And just to, to make you aware, we do have an online audience uh, who are participating in this event as well. So if, if you feel the need to leave at any time, be aware that the international audience may also see your comings and goings. <laughs> So uh, let, me, let me start by introducing um, the panel to you. Rania A. al Mashab joins us, Minister of uh, International Cooperation for Egypt. Uh, thank you for being here. Jürgen Karl Zattler, Director General of the Federal Ministry for uh, Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany. A warm welcome. Richard Baldwin, Professor of International Economics, the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies uh, in Switzerland, and uh, Gilbert fosson hongbo the Director General of the ILO uh, in Geneva. And my name is Jeff Cutmore, and I've been broadcasting all morning for CNBC downstairs. So um, um, if, if you didn't see the program, um, I think you can go back and watch it on this. Uh, and I, it, it comes highly recommended, so, uh, so please go and do that. I won't talk for too long. I just wanted to say thank you to Klaus and Hilda and uh, Sadia for giving me the opportunity to um, host this uh, opening panel, which, which is incredibly important. Um, I think, as Sadia described that um, study by The Economist, I mean, look, they are economists. So we do understand that they have the ability to change their minds and quite often the opinions are conflicting. But I think what they actually tell us is that there is a lot of confusion about what's actually happening at the moment. We know the macro story, growth appears to be slowing, but we don't have significant recessions yet. We still have a war in Europe. Uh, we have an ongoing dispute between China and the United States, which may or may not become meaning, meaningfully significant for trade flows and growth. So the macro, at a very high level, looks terrifying. And every day you read the newspaper and you watch TV shows and there is someone trying to worry you about the state of the world. But at, at a very micro level, and we're going to talk here a lot about the macro level, but at a very micro level, there are people like a guy called Mark, who I play golf with occasionally, who for a decade has run a plastic manufacturing business that sells into supermarkets in the UK, children's products by and large. And probably about five years ago, when Beijing started lifting the price of workers or the wages of workers, um, even before COVID, he started to think about whether he should still get his goods manufactured in China. And so he began to move some of that manufacturing to Vietnam, to Bangladesh, to other low-cost centres. And an economy is made up of millions of decisions that are made every day that aggregate into a, a bigger story. And then, of course, we had COVID, and then that was a reason for him to move out of China completely. And then he got a cold call from someone who was going to set up a manufacturing plant in the southeast of England. I mean, the guy must be crazy, right? Why would you set up a manufacturing plant in the southeast of England with all the associated higher costs of manufacturing and so on? But then he explained that there weren't actually many people that were going to work there. It was primarily machines that were going to make the products. So he could bring down the costs. And so we talked about it. And I said to Mark, you know, this, this seems interesting. But, you know, the world has so far been about importing your product from the lowest cost centers and uh, managing all the frictional elements that come with that, whether that's currency risk, whether that's uh, the miles that your product has to travel, whether it's uh, the fact that a customs officer may need a bribe to get your goods out of it, and so on and so forth, right? We know that there are many of those. And, and he said to me, look, um, I've shortened my supply chain. I've removed a lot of the currency risk. I have um, taken out the, uh, the, the, the COVID-related uh, risks going forward whole plethora of reasons why he was taking those decisions. 
So that, to me, seems like a deglobalization story. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a sort of a localization of manufacturing and sale story. But I just wonder, is that typical of what is happening more broadly across the global economy? And, and Jürgen, if, if you don't mind, can I ask you, because we come into this panel with the assumption that globalization has peaked, and for all of the reasons that everybody in this room has read about, we are now deglobalizing. Is that actually true? Um, in fact, I think it's not true. You just said that it's leveling out. Um, and under this macro level, I think you can see many interesting things. Uh, you have mentioned uh, China and the rising costs of labor. This will have an impact, uh, but also now resilience, of course, uh, and the diversification of uh, of your uh, supply has an impact than the uh, global transformation we have to do in terms of uh, decarbonization will have an impact. For example, on the commodity markets, we see a strong, a strong shift in, in commodity uh, supply. Uh, we see um, a, a little bit of decline in manufacturing, and we see an upward trend in services. So this is also a kind of restructuring of the global economy, but it's not uh, just, you know, a blunt uh, uh, leveling out or decline. So that's important. So we're, we've got a restructuring going on. So what currency are we going to globalize in going forward? Because again, depending on what you read, we are de-dollarizing and China and Russia and some Middle Eastern countries want to move the global economy away from reliance on dollar trade settlement. So maybe let's ask Richard, our, our economist, um, is that true? Are we de-dollarizing? And if so, what does that mean for the new trade paradigm? Yes, it's true. I'm an economist. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for my <laughs> earlier comments about economists. No, no it's, you know, it's, it, somebody had to be. I just got up late, was the only thing left. Um, <laughs> No, so, you know, good luck with that. Uh, the dollar has been the vehicle currency in currency markets, trading in the uh, uh, asset market and in the uh, commodities market for a very long time. And that net, those network externalities, overlapping network externalities, make it very difficult to move. Now, the, the role of the dollar, you can see it uh, year by year, is declining in terms of, for example, uh, central bank reserves and things like that. But I don't know if it's out of line with the decline of the Western share of world GDP. In fact, it's probably declining less quickly than the Western share of world GDP. So in some sense, it's reflecting the, the rise of, of other, other places. But in terms of another currency taking over the, the role of the dollar, I, I think that's very, very hard. And, and I must say, I've been at this business for 35 years, and I've heard at least three or four major assaults. OK, it's over. The dollar's done. It's going to be the euro. And then, you know, the, the dollar's done. It's going to be the renminbi. But I, I don't see the combination of trading goods, the foreign exchange markets, and the deep capital markets being reproduced by any other currency. What do you see, though? Because uh, the experience of uh, sanctions and the use of the dollar system against some countries has obviously made a lot of other countries rethink how they use the dollar in trade settlement. So what does the... We've agreed that we're adjusting. There are structural changes taking place. What do those changes imply, do you think, in terms of other currencies becoming more significant? Well, so I, the way I would think of there's a big push to remove the financial weaponization of the dollar by creating some sort of backdoor or maybe some sort of cryptocurrency way of trading that avoids it. And, and we've seen with the sanctions against Russia, for instance, that, and, and Iran has led to trading in other currencies. But that, I don't think, is going to catch on and generalize. But I can very easily see, and, and a number of people have tried to do it, is to create this, this backdoor for uh, high value, it would be expensive, but high value uh, transactions that get out of the American uh, banking system and therefore the American uh, finan uh, weaponization of the financial system. Small, small stuff. Small stuff so far, but it is happening. 
Okay. Um, Minister, let, let me ask you, one of the other big stories that we've always, I think, tried to focus on is the direction of flow, north-south, south-north, but south-south now increasingly, we understand, is important. Bring us up to date. How strong are those flows and how is that changing north-south or south-north? Okay, well, I'm also another economist on this panel. Um, uh, uh, let me say that, uh, uh, you know, there are certain common challenges which create common denominators for countries, be it in the north or the south, but more so in the south. For instance, uh, there's an SDG goal by 2030 that many countries wanted to uh, achieve. And this is a growth summit. So in these SDGs, you had uh, no poverty, no hunger, uh, quality of jobs. And we, we heard uh, from Sadia uh, how uh, uh, you know, the technology might create displacement and therefore skills. So there's, a, there's a, a financing gap for the SDGs. There's a climate challenge, which also, uh, uh, as much as there's discrepancy between the North and the South on that, there are common goals. Uh, and this requires, again, uh, a, a big scale of financing. So in this uh, uh, environment, uh, there are, there's a need to be very fast uh, in order to adapt uh, and also to create resilience. And that's where uh, sharing experiences under South-South cooperation become extremely important. Uh, because there are countries that have uh, created programs and projects uh, uh, with certain strategies that can be very easily replicated in order to uh, create the momentum for sustainable growth, to be able to close uh, the gaps when it comes to the SDG goals, to be able to face not de-globalization, but the restructuring that is taking place. Your example of Mark, this is local uh, uh, localization, but also localization has a flavor of globalization because countries need to see where the comparative advantage is. And that's how you're able to invite more investment, either from your private sector or also uh, uh, to create the jobs which are uh, most needed. Um, emerging markets, Africa, huge uh, youth numbers, uh, need for more jobs uh, and therefore uh, this concept of south-south uh, uh, cooperation and then north-south where we also see uh, with uh, different uh, multilateral development banks of IFIs uh, the programs that have worked in one place can also be uh, moved uh, into uh, or replicated. Uh, and this is the whole concept uh, out of uh, COP27 with the scaling of projects, with moving to see what has worked with renewables, uh, uh, mitigation projects, adaptation projects. So the actual operationalization mm. uh, of attracting flows and attracting private sector investments in uh, key uh, objectives such as climate change particularly. And if I could follow up, um, one of the headline stories we were reporting on this morning was obviously First Republic Bank. Uh, and the banking story has been a significant story and event that has us, again, you know, worried about growth going forward. Lending and financing are incredibly important to trade flow and the continued South-South story. What progress is being made? What concerns might you have about the, that progress being um, stalled by what's happening elsewhere in the financial plumbing? Um, when we talk about uh, globalization, deglobalization, I think what we're seeing today is that we are more coupled than ever before. And, and if, we, if we take a look at uh, the macro backdrop, it's a very uh, tough macro backdrop, uh, high interest rates globally, the risks related to uh, a recession, no recession, but definitely a slowdown and a massive slowdown. Uh, the number of successive shocks one after the other, so it's this uh, poly shocks or poly crises, uh, has its way. So, I mean, we just, as emerging markets came out of COVID, uh, you know, starting the recovery, hit by uh, price shocks related to food, energy uh, on the back of the war. Um, now, this risk of financial uh, stability and just coming out of the spring meetings in Washington, again, uh, a very important message on what central banks should do uh, uh, this, uh, this trade-off between financial stability versus inflation and growth. So these are real questions. You said the prospects and you also said concerns. I think the concerns 
uh, are uh, way more now, and we have to work through th these concerns to create prospects. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be um, uh, uh, very difficult. And I think uh, the unraveling of the systemic uh, outcomes or systemic risks of the banking uh, situation uh, is yet to uh, is yet is yet to be seen. Hopefully, not uh, uh, too big. But again, uh, I think there is. Uh, yet uh, uh, numbers on how much this will cost and how much it will uh, have a ripple effect on other banks. Gilbert, we've just seen um, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of workers around the world spend a day marking that day by the fact that their household income has declined, their wages are not keeping up with inflation, mm. and as they see growth slow, in their economies, they fear for their jobs. The report that's been released here has very sobering numbers about the likely loss of jobs going forward for a number of reasons, some to do with technology, but a lot to do with growth. Tell us a little bit more about what changes you see unfolding at this time and whether you are optimistic or pessimistic about the globalization story. Um, unfortunately, I'm always a, a very optimistic guy, so you, um, and uh, sadly, I'm not an economist. <laughs> 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 uh, um, but if, uh, if you allow me to quickly rebound from the um, earlier discussion, um, I think the, the trend we're seeing in the globalization, I would tend to uh, really to agree with Jorgen that I would not expect it to just go down the, um, the drain. Um, yes, it is stagnating, and that stagnation started, let's recall, since the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So it's not even, it's not COVID um, on, on that. But it is the, 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 the transformation that we are seeing happening with the, the near-shoring and the, the friend-shoring um, and the uh, relocalization of manufacturing, both manufacture and the services. I will let, one will expect that um, to, 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 to continue. But if I take the example, a very good example that uh, you, you're giving, um, yes, AI, yes, technology will uh, change it. I just uh, came from the G7 Labour minister, uh, Minister's meeting in uh, um, Kurashiki in Japan, and we visited um, a Mitsubishi um, plant there, where you, you have about 1,600 workers and, and 1,000 robots. Uh, on, in, the, in the whole um, production. So we're getting almost to um, very soon 50-50 on, on, on that, back to your point that you, you, you're making. But the, the real point that I'm making in terms of the, the new trend of globalization, you have to count on the fact that the countries from the, the, from the, the, the south uh, or the low or middle income, the emerging economy, um, clearly they want to, they will be also turning the page uh, of just exporting raw materials. So the, the, the whole value chain will also have to happen in their countries. And therefore, though you may want to regionalize the supply chain uh, and French shoring, you still have to build that into consideration, which is one. Secondly, um, which is um, um, quite, I believe, very positive, um, is the, the, the fact that the use of uh, artificial uh, intelligence or technology, mm. um, thanks to globalization, maybe is really much more open to all countries than you will expect uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the past. So it will depend heavily on those countries that are much more prepared to transform their um, technological um, um, modus operandi on, 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 on that. Third uh, point, quickly reacting, certainly adding uh, to uh, Professor Baldwin uh, a point, and again I agree. Um, I wouldn't say the de-dollarization of the global business. Um, of course, we can look at that from a political angle, but you can also see that as not necessarily to get away from the dollar, but to diversify and therefore to reduce the excessive dependency on the dollar. So it's not necessarily um, to just get a weapon to, and, and this is not in, in my, it's clear to me that it's not just um, Iran, Russia, uh, um, China that are looking to that. I think a lot of countries uh, wants to diversify their dependency on one single, uh, one single currency, be it the dollar or the euro, when you think about it. 
that all of that obviously has impact uh, on the, uh, the, the, the world of work. And, and from the technology um, point, um, we in ILO, we estimate that um, um, between now and 2030, the SDG uh, deadline, yes, about 100 million new jobs in the uh, technology um, will be created. At the same time, millions of jobs, close to 70, 75, will be lost mm. um, um, with a net net gain of around 25 million, uh, million jobs. So, uh, as I like to say, none of us want to be in the, in the category of 75. Mm. Um, this is why, and uh, I'm very glad when um, um, Professor Schwab and uh, Sadia were mentioned that at the beginning, the whole reskilling and, uh, and upskilling become crucial in our way and our way forward. Uh, what we also see, uh, um, and see happening, you're referring to um, uh, May 1st um, um, day, and it is good to remind ourselves the, the, the origin of May 1st. And that goes back to 19th century, 1884 or so, when workers in Chicago was really manifest, were demanding eight hours day schedule, mm. not the 12, 15 hours uh, day on, on, on that. So my point is that with all those transformations that we are looking at, for business sake, we have to ensure or we have to keep in mind what was said in, in, in 1944 in Philadelphia, what we call Philadelphia Declaration, that poverty anywhere is a threat to prosperity everywhere. So in moving forward, not only is it a matter of the job we are creating, but it's also a matter of the quality of more and more the quality of the job. And when I'm referring to the quality, I'm not looking for the moon, uh, is basically ensuring a dignifying job that the job is not a commodity and that it comes with a minimum voice for the workers and a protection for the work. Okay, um, you brought up AI and it is, um, I think as uh, Klaus said, you know, the topic of the moment. Um, Professor, I know you've written on robotics in the past, which was a previous wave of modernization, if you like, of workplaces. Uh, again, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic are you about AI and what it ultimately means for growth and for employment? So uh, I would like to put together two things, both the, and I want to focus on the service sector, because I think the story of automation and globalization was about mining, agriculture, and manufacturing for the last 25 years, but I think going forward, it's going to be mostly in the service sector. And the digital technology is advancing both of those at the same time. International telework is becoming a real thing, and automation of service sector jobs is becoming a real thing. So I've... My personal take is that it's going to change every job, how we do it in the service sector, but not eliminate many jobs. And I think it may very well have, I'm again an optimist like Gilbert here. I have a question for you, by the way, a little later on. But um, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the AI is essentially wisdom in a can. And so it's giving more power to all workers, but especially those average workers. So if you take an, an AI, for instance, and give it medical AI, give it to a nurse, he or she is much more capable than they were before, the doctor too, a little bit. So I think this AI will be uplifting to the middle class because it's in essence the most expensive, most talented workers are people who have 20 years experience and know how to apply that. That's what AI does overnight. So I think it will be uplifting for the middle class. That's, that's my but it will be extremely disruptive in the sense that every job will change. There'll be automation of certain things and everybody will learn how to deal with it. Or what I, I say on Twitter all the time is, AI won't take your job, it's somebody using AI that'll take your job. And so you better learn how to use AI. Jürgen, just to bring you in on this, because um, I think we've largely thought about these new technologies evolving very rapidly in already developed economies. Uh, that seems to be the locus for the development of a lot of this, this technology. What does it imply for developing economies 
and can develop, developing economies embrace and internalize the technology as quickly and will the consequences be fair and equitable for everybody and if not how can that be changed or how can they be helped and if yes well we should celebrate but what's what's your thought on that yes uh, again uh, it's it's complex uh, i think on the one hand um, uh, it's a challenge for developing countries uh, because uh, we have seen, uh, for example, your example uh, in uh, the southeast of, of UK, uh, we have seen onshoring because it becomes so attractive uh, to use machines to do the work, uh, and in particular because the labour uh, costs in, in China have uh, increased. So I think that's something which is, is not good for developing countries, perhaps for some of them, like China, being well advanced, advanced uh, in um, uh, in modernizing and automizing uh, the uh, economies. But on the other hand, of course, the new technology and digital uh, technology can be a huge uh, uh, potential for developing countries. Uh, look at um, agriculture, precision agriculture, look at services you can do remote now health services, uh, for example, which can have a big impact on, on the SDGs and on, on, on the health part of uh, the, uh, the SDGs. So there is, there is a potential where also poor countries can perhaps uh, find a, 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 a piece uh, in, the, um, in, in the global value chains in the services area. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this? I see a lot of nodding. Maybe I just add, I, I agree with Jürgen, but, um, um, and I go back to your in it, first question about the macro scene. Mm. Because for countries to be able to attract uh, uh, such opportunities, uh, the perception of risk has to be one which is um, manageable. And what we're seeing from the global backdrop is a lot of downgrades and a lot of uh, reassessment of risk for good reason. But again, it's... it's, it's uh, it's a period of several shocks, and therefore, as countries were moving forward on their development paths and so forth, there are, uh, you know, um, uh, sand in the wheels, if you will, because of uh, uh, the complications uh, in the backdrop. So I think this is just a, a real uh, um, uh, extra uh, uh, challenge which might uh, slow down things. So the idea is how can we, uh, through the um, uh, narrative of stakeholder engagement, uh, uh, government policies, private sector, MDBs, so forth, push uh, forward so that we are not kept back uh, and create more divide because of uh, uh, a very um, current circumstance which is uh, pressuring everyone. Mm. If I can, yeah, maybe to complement that um, two point that you mentioned, one, and um, you're going to just talk about the, ag, the agriculture sector. It's something that we should watch. Um, particularly since COVID and, and, and followed by the, the, the spiking of the, uh, um, the, 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 the grain and the fertilizers cost uh, after the, uh, um, the, the, the war in Ukraine started it. Um, today, um, continental Africa uh, imports 70 billion um, food a year, 70 billion uh, uh, dollars. And if you couple that with the ongoing um, challenge, but um, progressing um, um, free trade agreement that the African countries are really trying to, um, to put together, that creates some kind of a positive outlook and uh, optimism that I was referring to. Mm. On the flip side, and you have a very, very good point, the financing that you, when you were referring to First Republic, and the, the financing, to me, is going to be one key matter that we will really have. Um, the, the, the World Bank announced, I believe, during the spring meeting that you know, they're planning to um, do everything possible to be able to inject more uh, $5 billion in financing every, every year. At the same token, I believe, is the UN that has estimated what is needed is $400 uh, million uh, um, a year. So it tells you a little bit to give you a sense of the magnitude of what, they, and they, what we can or what the IFI say they can and what are, are, are the needed. So the financing both from 
at the macro and at the uh, uh, micro level is going to be uh, challenging. And just, just briefly, um, Gilbert, one of the um, much vaunted desires, I think, of multilateral organizations like this one and non-governmental bodies that are focused on these issues is to see the green economy emerge as a significant employment opportunity going forward. But we've just come through an energy crisis in Europe and we continue to see headline oil at just below $80 a barrel and we're worried about growth. Is that going, is that desire slipping, fading, or does it represent a meaningful opportunity still? Certainly not. I would certainly not say that is, uh, is, uh, is slipping. Um, and by the way, I think we need to keep the political momentum, which was created, you know, since the Paris Agreement, we see that momentum growing up until the, um, the, 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 the COP27 in Chamonix and 26 in Glasgow. Uh, and, and, and others. Um, so it's not uh, I'm sleeping. You see, on the flip side, the, the just transitions is going to be crucial. We need to pay more attention to the transition. Not only the green transition to decarbonizing the economy, is the energy tr uh, transition, is the digital uh, transition. And the energy transition you're talking about, uh, this is where you, you, you really have to mix um, both the environmental, the climate change concern that we need to keep high, and also look at that from um, a, a, a country that had to manage multiple challenges. You know, if today, you, you, I don't know, we can see many countries, uh, um, what comes to my mind in Senegal with the gas that um, they, they, they started or they're about to start um, I'm trading, and you know that can contribute um, to your immediate um, SDG goals. At the same token, you know you want to move toward renewable um, energy. What's how do you balancing? Um, you just it's a challenge have to, for it's everyone. a challenge for everyone. Yeah. And to me, it does not mean that you're giving up no. on the on the momentum. Okay, let's open the the, the floor to conversation. Um, and questions. Um, who'd like to ask a question to any of our panelists, if you could identify yourself and, um, and then direct the question to whoever you'd like to ask the question of. Can I see a hand up? Yep. Can we get a microphone to that gentleman here? And is it possible to open one of these uh, windows? Because I think we're all... We're all yeah. You don't need to be an economist to melt, do you? <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, I think we, the, we, we need a clear voice. Yeah, the, the air conditioning is struggling. Yep. Yeah. Can I, yes, I'm JJ from Japan. I'm teaching MBA and also running high school. And then the problem is when I'm teaching those students, younger students in Japan, quite a lot of them think growth, economic growth is bad things. Right? So even for MBAs, quite a lot of people said, oh, JJ, I come here for not for the company's growth. Yeah. What do you think is the future benefit of growth, economic growth? Who'd like to take the question? Uh, I will volunteer Come before on. the professor. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, keep them tight minutes. and then we can get some more I'll, questions in. I, I, I think when we talk only about economic growth is what the youth, the youngsters don't want to hear anymore. We need to really start saying that you have three pillars that have to move side by side. The economic growth, protecting uh, mother nature, environment, and the social spending. I stop there. Yes, I think we, we need growth uh, until we arrive in communism. You know, some have read perhaps Karl Marx. There, everybody gets what he or she uh, needs, and there we don't need growth. But we are not there yet. So we need growth, and in particular in developing countries. And uh, that's a big problem in terms of jobs, in terms of SDGs. And there, I would like to, to stress one point. Mm. How tough, how hard the situation is at the moment in developing countries. Uh, the minister has, uh, has uh, raised the point of um, interest rates and the cost of capital. I mean, these countries, they have low growth, they have many pro development problems, they have to finance the global transformation towards decarbonization. Mm -hmm. And 
capital is very, very expensive there. And I think we have to, to look at that. And therefore, we address the issue in the World Bank. We want to reform the World Bank. My ministers asked for that uh, in, at the annual meetings last year. Now it's on the way, but this has to be really a game changer. And we have to look at other issues in the, in the international uh, architecture. Hopefully there will be, uh, and hopefully, but there will be the summit in, in Paris organized by, by France on financing. I think we have to find uh, solutions there because it's about development um, and SDGs, but it's also about uh, financing the global transformation we need. Professor? So let me just say that uh, your students are Japanese and maybe Japan doesn't need that much more growth. But there's a large number of people in the world where if their son breaks their arm and it gets complicated, he dies. That's the way a lot of people live. And for them, getting income above, say, $10 a day, you know, be able to have some sort of security, owning some property or a house, that's what growth is. So the way I think you think about it is growth or GDP per capita is not a measure of social economic welfare but it's correlated with an awful lot of those measures, especially in the bottom half of the world income distribution. So the degrowth narrative, I think, makes a lot of sense to a lot of people, to say nothing in Switzerland, um, what more could you want? Uh, but for a lot of the world, they still need GDP to rise because they don't have the material conditions for a decent lifestyle. But I, will hope we, I will hope we agree though that you shouldn't just focus on, on growth and hoping that growth, you know, la main visible, growth will solve the rest. It's important that we bring, back, we need growth. I want to, for me, it's very clear from my own perspective, we need the growth. But that growth should not be looked in an isolated way and say that later on it will take care of the, the social and the environment. Rania, did you want to talk about this? No, I mean, I just want to say that uh, for the just transitions to happen, we need just financing. And just financing means that countries' development pathways need to be respected in uh, achieving their climate goals, which are part of the global goals. And this is through quality and quantity of financing. And there's a lot of work that took place at COP27 uh, uh, to give a definition of just financing and principles of just financing and how because of the cost of capital, we need uh, more concessionality in order to bring down the cost of capital, to draw in the private sector much needed for uh, the transitions, but also for growth. Because if we think about each and every um, uh, climate project, be it mitigation or adaptation, as a project that will create jobs, as a project that will add to the country's development and therefore growth rates, mm -hmm. then uh, this is where we will have a window uh, to push forward on, uh, on financing. Being uh, the governor at the World Bank, we are having very active discussions uh, on, uh, we finished the mandate, the new mandate, but the operational, the new operational model of the World Bank. How are we going to be able uh, to um, translate the mandate into action? Uh, uh, the 15 billion uh, from the World Bank was an experiment also there's a part with hybrid capital going into the markets and, and trying to see how we can increase that. So there's a, there's a, a very vibrant discussion. The verdict is still out. Uh, and that's where um, examples that took place earlier and worked should be scaled up so that we save time and create more growth in areas that need them. Let's take a question here. My name is Hora al Khazemi from United Arab Emirates. My question is, what would you perceive the, um, uh, the undermined accelerators of growth at the moment? Because we are stuck in between reality and perception and fiction at the same time. Uh, we are in a world where we are bracing the uh, economic growth of advanced technology like AI, saying that there will be a contribution by 15% to the global GDP in 2030 and whatnot. But at the same time, uh, uh, we have uh, a level of growth that r r uh, lies within uh, advanced education, um, uh, empowerment, uh, and, and equal uh, communities and societies that surpasses the 15% to 30% growth opportunities. So what would be, from your perception, uh, the undermined growth accelerators uh, given the current economic outlook? Who wants? Professor. You're the development guy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the question is really challenging because there are so many uh, 
country situations, and probably it's not really possible to find an answer. Um, when you look at, at low-income countries, uh, that's more my focus, and there I think uh, the, the sources of growth are in the new commodities, because the landscape is very rapidly shifting. The G7 has decided to create a club for commodities now, and they signaled that they would accept, in a way, commodity, you know, um, 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 a kind of uh, in, in industrial um, uh, development uh, based on commodities, you know, so uh, local content uh, issues. So that's, that's a signal, I think. Uh, this could be a basis for growth uh, based on commodities. For low-income countries, another one is, uh, um, is uh, uh, light manufacturing. Um, and of course, uh, I think linked to, to the, so the, uh, the new uh, areas uh, of services, what I already said. But for more developed countries, of course, uh, middle-income countries, the situation uh, is, uh, is, is a different one. Let's try and get another question in here. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Omol Mera with Loudest Foundation. I have a question for the Director General. I think it's really interesting that the conversation thus far has been oriented toward the future, the potential for growth, what we need to do to address it. And I thought that the jobs report did a good job of highlighting the challenges of the present, including the gaps in social protection. So I just wonder how you view sort of a positive future-oriented mission to grow with the real challenges that communities and countries are facing now and even meeting basic social protection floors. Thanks. And let's use that as a wrap-up question, I think. Uh, so if we could get an answer from everybody, who'd like to start? Um. Uh, yeah, let me uh, very clearly on the social protection. This is one with huge thing that ILO um, is working on. Some of you might know last year, and this, even the Secretary General um, Gutierrez and ILO launched this uh, global accelerator for job and social protection. And we recall that half of the population, 4 billion people, have zero, zero, zero protection. Zero protection, half of the population. So imagine um, if we were to provide basic, not so many different floor, basic, basic uh, minimum protection to every uh, um, citizen in the world. The universal uh, um, social protection is really key. And again, for that, obviously financing is, is, a, is a challenge and therefore you need the growth. Um, to be able to generate that uh, um, financing. The IMF and the uh, um, ILO are, are working on, on four pilot cases in how we work with government to really try to create the maximum fiscal space that can be used to finance those social, um, um, social um, um, protection. So it's very uh, um, critical, again, in providing um, that social dimension and balancing what I call the protection and the employment. Professor. So uh, I'd like to be optimistic on this. And I, I think we have, uh, we're in a new world that consumers and workers, at least in the rich nations, care. It's not just about how much, but how. And I think in some sense the consumers have joined the value chain and they're demanding things are made with respect to labor. And they're demanding that they work for corporations that have plans to make sure that there's no slave labor or whatever in their supply chains. So I think that's the optimistic way to go forward. And that's fundamentally based on awareness, transparency, and information. And that's where, I, in my view, where it's all come from, is people actually know how their t-shirts are made nowadays, whereas in the past, all they did is how, how much it cost and how nice it was. So that's, that's my uh, optimistic take, is inform transparency and uh, empower the consumers to demand better conditions. Great. We've got two minutes. Jürgen, you want to go? I think it's not only about awareness and transparency. I think the state, the government, has to play a very important role in this transformation, has to set the framework, has to guide uh, and transform the, the economy. We have made bad experience mobilizing private sector, very bad. It's flat, what we mobilize in the climate area. So we have to have a sector approach uh, in the sense of Mariana Mazzucato, where uh, uh, the, the government together with the industry sits together, says that that's where we want to go, decarbonization. What does it take? This is a sector transformation approach and not a 
kind of transaction approach. Minister. Yeah, it, on the acceleration of growth, I think one of the topics uh, is gender equality, because there have been statistics, and since Sadia is here, that more uh, uh, female participation will push and accelerate growth. That's on, uh, on that issue. Uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, climate financing uh, and uh, social protection, each of the goals pushing forwards does have an implication on uh, the public, so social protection uh, or um, social programs that have worked in countries can be scaled. That's very important. We have, for example, today with the uh, uh, macro situation and the fallout from uh, uh, food prices and energy prices, uh, cash transfers, uh, and I think out of COVID, uh, the using the digital platforms that are able to uh, uh, you know, allow these disbursements to go to the, the people most uh, in need is, is something which is uh, quite, uh, quite important. But I go back to the global backdrop because fiscal space is very small. Uh, there needs to be more cooperation, not just uh, government, but also uh, all stakeholders, uh, particularly when it comes to concessional finance. OK, thank you very much. So lunch follows, and I'd just like to thank our panellists for their contributions and for you for the questions.